Anything on time of death? He died less than an hour ago, apparently. That was turned up to maximum. 20 rock hard balls were bowled at top speed, straight at him. You're listening to Midsummer Murders Mayhem, the official podcast for the hit global television series Midsummer Murders. I'm your host, Nikki Chapman. In this podcast, I get to examine the Midsummer Murders television series in audio form, one nail biting episode at a time. Spoiler alert, we leave no stone unturned, no evidence unchecked, no suspect unquestioned. So, if you haven't seen the episode in question, I suggest you do it right now. In this episode of Midsummer Murders Mayhem, it's time to get your cricket whites out in Last Man Out. Tensions run high in Lower Pampling as a new type of cricket threatens a century of tradition. When a star cricketer dies during a tournament, DCI Barnaby and DS Winter's investigation draws them into a dangerous game with a surprise visitor from Barnaby's past. With the help of cast, crew and devoted superfans, I'll be covering some of the most important scenes, discussing the most intriguing characters and seeing who can spot those cameos. Helping me this week is award-winning Scottish comedian, actor, presenter and, most importantly, die-hard Midsummer Murders enthusiast, Ashley Story. Maybe it's just the Scottish in me, but if I found out my friend is sleeping with my husband and then I shouted at her and she runs away, I don't go back to that place we had that argument every year to be like, "Hmm, this is where we had that argument. Coming up, we're going to be hearing from our in-house mortician, Carla Valentine. You can sort of see the head, you know, bobbing off the back wall when the cricket ball hit it. It did seem very violent and obviously effective because, yeah, it would absolutely kill you. Plus... We'll finish things off with a round of our superfan face-off quiz hosted by Ashley and featuring contestants from around the globe. We're going to go straight to the first question. If at any point you're like, I don't understand what that Scottish lady is saying, please do stop me and I shall repeat it in an American accent and that'll be fun for everyone. Oh, we might do that on purpose then. <laughs> also, be sure to stick around for the end where we wrap everything up announce exactly who committed the murderous crimes and how Barnaby solved them. Are you excited to talk about cricket? I quite like cricket. I come from a family that used to go to the cricket and my husband takes me along as well to Lord. So I'm really, really fortunate. I do quite like it. I don't understand the rules. What about you, Ashley? I have no interest in it. It's boring baseball it's posh people rounders. I can't believe there's jumpers involved. It's not a real sport if knitwear is involved. <laughs> it doesn't make sense. <sighs> Cricket is played around the world, Nikki, but I don't think it's played in America. Like I said, it's kind of like a posh version of baseball. Can you give our American listeners, since you have been to actual cricket games, what cricket is for our Americans? You have now thrown me under the bus because even though I've been, I like the <laughs> hospitality. Cricket is a game that goes back, I don't know, 150 years. It's played by gentlemen. It's also played by women now. It's played actually by everybody, which is so Mm. great. But for years, for, for decades and decades, it was a gentleman's sport. They play in creams or whites, as they're called, but in actual fact, they're creams. And the whole point of it is that you throw a ball, the man bats it, they try to catch him out and they stop at four o'clock for afternoon tea. Is that good enough? Nail on head, Nikki. Nail on head. Well, this is a really interesting episode, isn't it? Last man out because one of our favourites comes back. (gasps) Be still my beating heart because it's none other than our favourite boy next door. Now a man, Ben Jones. Yes. I wasn't expecting him at all. I nearly fell off my seat. So we really should start with the opening, shouldn't we? Because it is a cricket match in the village of Lower Pampling. And the good news is Sarah Barnaby just happens to be there with her sixth form students, which is always a lovely coincidence. But it's an exciting (laughs) game because it's the C10 Slam Tournament, a tournament that's been taken from Australia to try and sort of sexy up cricket. 
and make it much, much quicker. More exciting, some might say, and it can be played on Mm. the village green. There are cheerleaders, there are fire cannons, there are big giant TVs. They are not kidding, Nikki. This is them trying to make cricket sexy. Yeah. Exciting. Yeah. Fun. Yeah. I quite like it, actually. I like the idea of it all happening in one day. You know who's won. Mm -hmm. It's also a very handsome lead cricketer who scores the winning bat. Would that be the right term? The winning bat. And his name is Leo Henderson. He wins. The crowd is jubilant. A couple of sapper's faces in the audience there. Um, And then Leo, for some reason, decides to, after winning for his team, go off and go into the practice nets. Not quite sure why he does it. But whilst he's there, he is a victim of a brutal attack by cricket balls. Yes, he is pummeled to death by cricket balls fired from a cricket ball machine. Yes. And it's unpleasant. Weirdly, when they do find his body, he's pretty much intact. I thought cricket balls were a lot harder than that. I thought he was going to be a lot more hurt than he was physically looking, but I think maybe Midsummer just don't want the gore. So no. <laughs> they pulled it back a little bit. But he a horrible time, absolute horrible way to die. So who finds the body? Listen to this. Who found the body? He's over here. Lower Pampling's 12th man. He said he went in to put some things away. One Jack Morris. I wonder if I might have a word, Mr. Morris. Call me Jack. Winter, um, talk to um, the team manager and Leo's teammates. Uh, see if there was any uh, friction out there on the field. And afterwards, uh, talk to his wife, establish whether he had any enemies outside cricket. Oh. I mean, you can tell John Barnaby's really taken aback. He hasn't seen Ben Jones in quite a long time. Ben's moved to the coast. And then suddenly, here he is in front of him, looking rather dashing, a few years older, and he says his name is Jack Morris. Here he is in Lower Pampling as the 12th man. Yes, he's back. Guess who's back? Back again. Jones is back. Tell your friends. It's very exciting. (laughs) (laughs) Very excited. I think, actually, only you and I have really got excited about this. But we don't know why he's back, and they look very, very uncomfortable. New interview room. I like it. Would you prefer to go to the station? You know I'm not involved. All I did was find the body. Why are you here, Jones? Tricky question, and you know I'd tell you if I could. You turn up in midsummer, and you don't think to get in contact. It's awkward. Because you're working. All I'm doing is renting a room off a distant family friend. Whatever it is you're really up to, it can't get in the way of my investigation. I'm just here to take in some cricket, hopefully get a game if I can. We both know you're here for more than that. But this murder takes priority at all times. And if you come across anything connected to it, you have to tell me. I think there's a little bit of brokenheartedness from John Barnaby because I think he feels a little bit abandoned by Ben Jones. He misses Ben Jones. Ben Jones was his first sort of midsummer friend and he's the godfather of his daughter. He feels like he misses him. I don't know. I think I might be reading too much into it. I got really emotionally invested in them two being best friends forever and I was heartbroken that that didn't happen. Also, I really enjoyed how Jamie Winter, who's our new DS, who's what I like to call the companion. I know that Midsummer Murders isn't Doctor Who, but there is a sort of Doctor Who vibe where you can change the Barnaby and you can change the companion, but there will always be a Barnaby and there will always be a companion. We've not done one with him before. What did you think of him, Nikki? Is the new sidekick did you love him well he certainly takes offense doesn't he to our jack morris and he smells a rat Mm -hmm. straight away and he keeps sort of probing and he's not sure why barnaby's got this funny sort of reaction to this jack morris and he doubts the way that barnaby is dealing with this suspect because at the end of the day jack morris or our ben jones was the first person to find the body so i quite like him yeah and he grows on you but i mean no one's going to be DS Ben Jones, I'm sorry. Well, he's probably gone up in the world now. He's not a DS anymore. So he's come over. He's moved to the area and he's living with a long lost relative called Jermaine Troughton, who we find out is a former cricketer. I think she played Mm -hmm. for England, but she is very, very much against this C10 Slam tournament. She's not wanting. So he's actually lodging with her. And by the way, she doesn't live anywhere sort of shambolic oh no she's got a beautiful house as well with lots of cricket paraphernalia all around and she this lady Jermaine is best friends with St John Beechwood but you don't call him St John you pronounce it St John 
So St. John, or yep. St. John as he's known, and Germain absolutely hate C10. You enjoyed uh, an illustrious cricket career, and yet now you want to ban it. Don't you want to keep village cricket alive? Chief Inspector, C10 is not the future of village cricket. It would be the death of it. They think it's the demise of cricket. So they sort of go to the whole village and they want a vote on this, whether they could get rid of it. They want a referendum, Nicky. And it's the tense thing in Britain. We've had a lot of them. But they want a referendum on C10 cricket. And it's got everybody up in arms. So who's behind then this C10? It is organiser, local businessman, entrepreneur, Elliot Lethando. He's brought C10 over from Australia. He's kind of bought the franchise. And whoever wins this big C10 competition gets to go to Australia. Whichever team wins gets to go to Australia and play over there. So it's going to be very lucrative. It's a big thing for the villages. But also people kind of want to keep cricket on the little greens with sweet jumpers and little sandwiches and no cheerleaders. A referendum to try and ban the C10 slam. The council are asking the entire village to come out and vote on it. Who runs the council? Two dinosaurs. Jermaine Troughton and St. John Beechwood. Would that be the same Jermaine Troughton who used to captain England ladies? Hmm. As the old girl lives and almost breathes. She's against C10, I take it. If you want to know who sent these threats, I'd start with her. That's right, Nicky. Elliot's been receiving threats sent via the mail about C10, the fast cricket game. I don't think it's that deep, but apparently people are feeling very strongly about the integrity of the cricket world and the kind of fox in the chicken coop that C10 might be. And we always know there's a subplot. Now, is this going to be the subplot? That is the question about these threats to try and get rid of it. Can I just say, Elliot is an architect and he lives in the most stunning property ever. So C10 is sort of a little bit of a sideline, but it is taking over his life. Absolutely taking it over his life. Yeah, we get from the get-go that there's some sort of fixing involved in this high-paced C10 cricket world. We can sense it. It's maybe not said explicitly, but we know that's what's going on. So we've got the murder of the first cricket captain, who was married to Elliot's wife's best friend. Is that right? Yes, Melody Henderson. Melody. So Leo is married to Melody. Elliot, we know, is this very, very talented architect, but also obsessed with this new cricket. And Serena is Elliot's wife. So Melody and Serena are best friends. Mm -hmm. And they are married to the owner of the cricket and the captain of the cricket. And the captain of the cricket gets murdered and the owner of the cricket is getting threatened. So we know that these women might be involved in it. They, they keep having these very cryptic conversations of, are you coming today? We go every year where they go to this tree and we don't know why and it's kind of like, what are they up to? Are they witches? That was my first thought, but maybe that was just a leap of fancy for me. Yeah, I, straight away, the first thing I thought was, are they doing magic? I felt a little bit sorry for Melody, but then although she's distraught because she's recently become a widow, our lovely Ben Jones or Jack Morris is very friendly with her, goes round to stay. She's scared because a branch hits the window and he offers to stay. But being a gentleman, and we wouldn't want him to disappoint us, he says, don't worry, I'll sleep on the sofa. But while he's there, he is snooping around. He finds a key, a mystery key under a cricket book, opens up a filing cabinet, and inside are thousands and thousands of pounds which we know that Melody has yes. no idea about. No idea whatsoever. But her husband obviously did. They've got financial problems. Massive. And her husband has been up to something, obviously, because he's got a hoard of cash and he's booked a cruise without yes. telling anybody. And paid cash for it as well. Where do you go to pay cash for a cruise? I, like when I'm, I sat there and I was like, how? Also, if you pay cash for anything or if you're given cash as a bribe, it always has to come in a black bag, doesn't it? It can't be in a briefcase or anything like that or a, a supermarket bag. It's always in a black rucksack, always. And then obviously Jones has to come clean. He's found this money and he says to Barnaby, I need to see you. And he explains everything. And you can see the relief on Jamie Winter's face that actually... He is one of us. He's not a suspect anymore. Yeah, Jamie Winter was convinced he was up to no good. So he's very relieved that Jones is a goodie and not, in fact, 
a body. Found this locked away in Leo Henderson's office. There's five grand in there. Found it how? His widow asked me to stay the night. Slept on the sofa. Won't Melody be missing this? I don't think she knows about it. This was Leo's secret. So the question is, who gave this money to him and why? So we know that Fitz's life is in danger because he is now the cricket captain. He approaches our Jack Morris. Don't forget, he's still following. This is Ben Jones. And he says to him, mm-hmm. look, mate, I can make you a little wager. I can make you a lot of money if you help fix the match. Jack Morris, Ben Jones, who they chat in the men's toilets, doesn't take the threats. He says, you know what? I'm not your man. I'm not going to get involved. By this time, we know that Fitz is really, really sweating. He's been told by Mr. Big to get Jack Morris on board, and Jack says no. So Fitz takes a phone call, goes to the tree, this tree in the middle of nowhere, and is killed with a wicket into the tree. He's skewered like a pig, really, on a stake. That's taking tree hugging a bit far, isn't it? Juan Fitz Thera, captain of Lower Pampling. Another dead captain. Indeed. Someone had the strength to do that to him. We found evidence that a blunt force was used on top of a sharpened cricket stump several times until he was pinned to the tree. So that means two captains have died, which isn't good really, is it? No, um, we find out through this that the reason why Ben Jones is there is he is undercover and he is following the match-fixing crime case. That's yes. what he's up to. As a police officer, he's undercover to try and get to the bottom of the match fixing. He played hard to get because he didn't want to appear too eager. Because if you appear too eager, you alert the criminals to you being a policeman. And that's very true. I watch a lot of investigation tapes and I watch a lot of interview tapes. And when policemen go undercover, especially in prisons, they're always too over eager and it gives the game away. They also swear too much to try and seem like they're bad guys and it do gives they? the game away. So Ben Jones, yeah, they do. It's funny. Anyway, Ben Jones, playing it cool. No, no, I don't want any bribe. Leave me alone. I'm a good cricket boy. But he's just trying to entice the villains in more with his playing hard to get. But you should feel bad for him because he's the one that gets Fitz murdered. If he'd signed up to it, Fitz probably wouldn't have been murdered. So we've got two deaths here. We also have the girls, Melody and Serena, taking a phone call, a mysterious phone call to meet by the tree. They both turn up, look at each other and go, what are the chances? Did you get the call? Yep, so did I. From somebody they don't know. Would you go to a tree in the middle of the countryside when it's like dawn or dusk from a number you don't know to say, meet me by the tree? They turn up, they're a little bit perplexed. They turn around And they get to see their old best friend, Scylla, sitting down and she has brought them together. But the last time they saw Scylla was under this tree 20 years ago. And it transcribes that Scylla was not only having a dalliance with Leo, remember he was the first person to get murdered, Melody's much-loved husband, but she was also pregnant. And they screamed and shouted at her and banished her from the village 20 years ago, practically, to the day. Yeah. Much like the Scarlet Letter, the lady in the Scarlet Letter, she was punished and banished for her dalliance with the cricket man and her subsequent pregnancy. She's also the daughter of Germaine, so England's ladies' cricket captain in the manor. It's a very sort of sinister moment where these two friends who have been returning to a tree every year to commemorate the time they screamed at their friend for getting pregnant to one of their husbands... Uh, witchcraft seems more of a reasonable idea of why they do this. I, Nikki, maybe it's just me, maybe it's just the Scottish in me, but if I found out my friend is sleeping with my husband and then I shouted at her and she runs away, I don't go back to that place we had that argument every year to be like, mm, this is where we had that argument. And also no one complains <laughs> about all. Leo. Leo, I mean, although he gets killed... Leo doesn't get criticised at all. It's all about poor oh. Scylla. And we find out that Sinjin has asked Scylla to come back because he feels that her mum, Jermaine, is missing her and he has orchestrated the whole thing. But Scylla, first of all, finds her two friends to say, how could you do that to me? How could you just run me out of the village when I was pregnant with a child two decades ago? Yeah. And Barnaby deduces Scylla was pregnant with Leo's child gave the baby away for adoption. 
she actually gets pulled up for stalking. She wasn't stalking at all. She was trying to see her son, which is really, really sad. Mm. Jermaine sees yeah. her and the meeting doesn't go well, even though mother and daughter haven't seen each other for 20 years. Sinjin realised that actually this hasn't been a great idea because she said, Mum, you left me. I rang you. I was pregnant. My best friends had had a go at me because I've had an affair and you didn't want to know. And that's why she left. So there's actually a really bad, sad twist to this. And Jermaine feels so, so awful, but still really doesn't say sorry or do anything about it. Yeah. So it is the C10 final. Jones has been promoted because he realises that he's yes. going to be the captain now. He's warned, Nicky. Oh, I was getting worried. This is, uh, he's been warned. Winter said to him, just don't become captain because the last two captains got <laughs> murdered. So don't do that. And he does a deal. He's Captain Jack. Barnaby is really, really worried for his safety and tells him to take care. And there's that, that emotional bond between them, isn't it? So it's the C10 final. The whole of the village is out. Jones is the captain. So we know there's bounty on his head. And just before the game is about to start, he is kidnapped by the killer. The good news is they find Jones. And although Jones looks a little bit battered and bruised, having had some spade or something cracked open on his head, all is well and the man survives once again. Good on, Jones. So let me tell you some of the cameos. Go on then. Let's start off with probably one of the most famous. Sinjin. Who plays Sinjin? John Bird played Sinjin. Very handsome in his younger days. Was famously in Bremner Bird and Fortune. Girls like you, Jabberwocky. A lot of stuff with Rory Bremner, who I once handed a flyer to at the Edinburgh Fringe. Did you? Get um, you? I flyered everybody. <laughs> <laughs> Probably a great stalwart of British television. Was in the Cluedo TV series that I used to watch when I was a very little girl as Professor Plum which was incredibly Aww. exciting to see him about again. But my favourite performance in this episode came from Germaine. I think that she was phenomenal, played by Susan Jameson. If you're a fan of British crime shows, then you will know her as Esther from New Tricks. 54 episodes she was in of that show. Wow. She also was in To Serve Them All My Days. She's also in The Queen, not the one you're thinking of, the weird old British television one of The Queen. A great, great performance for Omer. She's got this great hardened face that she can play quite a cold character who can warm very quickly. And yeah, I was super excited to see her in this. Natasha Little played Melody. Your favourite character, Paul Reynolds played Butler. Yes. Who had all the faces. I loved him. I thought he was brilliant. And you might have known him. Child actor was in Press Gang. Was he? Yes, with um, Dexter Fletcher. He was like the third listed cast. Yeah, I thought he was fantastic. I, I really loved him. Every time he came on, I was like, that face works. He's earned his money, definitely. Anybody else we should be looking at? For me, a big shout out is Elliot Lothando was played by Joe Dixon. I'm a big fan of the West End and musical theatres. And he's currently starring in The Prince of Egypt, live from the West End as Pharaoh. Very nice. Anyone coming over to the UK perhaps could still see him. That cricket pavilion looks famous to me, Ashley. Is it? Is it a cameo in its own right? You're the expert in locations and buildings. So if you say that that's a famous pavilion, I believe you. My husband did get very excited. It's the cricket ground pavilion at Wormsley. And I know lots of people when they come over to the UK visiting want to go to key areas. There we go. Big old famous cricket pavilion. Maybe the biggest cameo of all is that cricket pavilion. Yes, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> I like this episode. Mm -hmm. I thought it was fun. And anything with Ben Jones in, it gets the thumbs up from me. We're now going to be celebrating strong female characters in Midsummer Murders, starting off with the first British Asian actor to join the regular cast. Majinda Verk joined the team as the hands-on pathologist Dr. Cam Carrymore at the beginning of season 18 and played that role until the end of season 19 when she took a job in Montreal. We're also going to be joined by our resident mortician Carla Valentine who will talk about diversity in the show 
and also in the industry. But first, here's Majinda. It's important to have this discussion. And the thing about Midsummers is it's so out there as a show, it's important to realise that people from all walks of life can be represented. Carla, it is great to have you with us. Thank you. Now, what do you think about the role Majinda played in the show itself, particularly as the second female pathologist taking over from Dr. Kate Wilding? The first thing that I noticed is that Cam is like the Gil Grissom of Midsummer Murders because she not only does forensic pathology, but she does absolutely everything else as well. I think it's just when it gets to the point where the police department, you know, um, Barnaby and, and, and co. don't seem to have anybody else to ask about forensic. So they're saying, you know, oh, Cam, you know, work out the, the age of that tree and, and stuff like that. I mean, these are all specialties, except for the fact that Cam ha- happens to have superpowers because, you know, it's not just forensic pathology that she focuses on, but apparently she can do absolutely everything. <laughs> and it's obviously nice by this point to have a female pathologist, because I think of a lot of the early episodes, of course, we have the male pathologist. Um, and in the later ones, we do have some females. And that is actually quite indicative of real life. More and more women getting into forensic science. I think just to, as a reflection of the times, it has gotten much more diverse over the sort of later years. I know when I first started to work in mortuary, it was it was me and several men but by the time I left 10 years later it was a team of pretty much entirely women so it's really sort of reflects reality in that way which I think is quite impressive so things have changed across the board and thank goodness for that okay now on to the episode then last man out what did you think of the deaths the causes of death were really quite violent, weren't they? But they were very creative ways. And I think, you know, that's something that Midsummer Murders has done much more as, you know, as it's gone on for the years, they've had to kind of top the creativity of their deaths because, you know, one gunshot or one one stabbing is not going to cut it anymore. So we see all these really interesting uh, modes of death. And I think the cricket ball one, I mean, that was pretty grim. The, the fact that you can sort of see the head, you know, bobbing off the back wall when the cricket ball hit it and everything. And it did seem very violent and obviously effective because, yeah, it would absolutely kill you. Um, when you see Cam at the scene and she's kind of directing the police and, and, and the specialists when they're trying to move the body, you know, that's very realistic. And then when she's in the mortuary itself and she's talking about the various injuries, it's quite realistic. That was our resident expert on the dead, mortician Carla Valentine. It's time for your favourite segment of the show. It's the Superfan Face-Off Mega Quiz with me, Ashley Story. And I am joined by two super fans, Mark and Sarah, who are both in Indiana. They are sat side by side. If their voices sound familiar, it's because they host their own Midsummer Murder podcast. I'm so excited. This is the first time we've had two people doing the quiz in the same room. I'm going to ask that you don't hit each other, please. <laughs> we'll try not to. We'll try not to. Now, here at the Superfan Quiz, we can't afford buzzers, so you have to make your own sounds. Mark, I'll come to you first. What is your buzzer sound? Amazing. And Sarah, what's your buzzer sound? Uh, Oh, that's a good sound, Sarah. Right. Our quiz today is on The Last Man Out. Are you aware of this episode? We have seen every episode of Midsummer at (laughs) least twice, if not three times or nine times. I'm sure you guys are going to absolutely nail this. So we're going to go straight to the first question. If at any point you're like, I don't understand what that Scottish lady is saying, please do stop me and I shall repeat it in an American accent and that'll be fun for everyone. We might do that on purpose then. (laughs) Amazing. Please don't. I might offend people. (laughs) Okay. Question number one. What is the name of the cricket team that murder victim Leo Henderson played for? Oh, I don't know. Marauders, maybe? It isn't. Oh, our geniuses have been stumped at our first question. The answer was the lower pampling Panthers. Oh, Panthers. Okay. It's okay. We're getting into it. That was just a warm-up question. (laughs) I'm worried now. (laughs) Yeah, I'm worried too. Question number two. The new format of cricket causing a stir amongst the villagers is called what? It's not speed cricket, but that's the essence of it. I'm looking for a letter and a number. Oh, I'm going to claim ignorance. Is it A3? No. (laughs) The answer was C10. Right, right, right. This is an easier one. In this episode, D.I. Ben Jones returns as an undercover detective using which name? Doesn't he use Barnaby as a name? No. No. Smith? Oh my gosh. Mm. We, our entire reputation is now destroyed. <laughs> wow. 
These are maniac level questions. I'm impressed with this. Yeah. No, I don't know. No idea. We have had some serious super fans. We've got a lady who knows every name of every dog that has ever appeared in Midsummer. So oh, it is for the very dedicated, pernickety, pedantic fans. I could probably do that. But I can't remember oh. Jones's undercover no. name. Nope. No chance. No. I'll give you initials, JM. Jack Morris. The answer. <laughs> yes. Yes. Oh, Mark. Nice. Oh, <laughs> wow. Come on, Mark. From the depth of my brain, I pulled that oh, out. You pulled it out of somewhere. <laughs> Mark there with a steel. He's wow. swiping the sweat from his brow. This is an intense quiz. Podcaster versus podcaster. Question number four. St. John Beechwood is always immaculately dressed. Which two colours are on the striped tie he often wears? Mm -hmm. Sarah? Red and blue. <laughs> Oh, so close, but no. I'm going to go red and green. No. Oh. I'm going to give you a clue first to get it. It's the colours of the Hogwarts house, Gryffindor. Green and yellow. No, it's red and yellow. Know your Hogwarts better. You can't just <laughs> guess every colour until you get it right. I'm sorry. <laughs> I was thinking Slytherin. Sorry. 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 Question number five. What do friends Melody and Serena do every year to mark the disappearance of their friend Scylla? They go to a tree where there's a heart on it. That is and correct. But Mark, you didn't buzz in, so I'm getting oh. Sarah the point. <laughs> I'm kidding. Ooh. Mark gets the point. Mark yeah. gets the point. I was being mean. <laughs> they go to the tree where there's a heart carved and they cut a little notch in it. You were yeah. bang on there, Mark. Six. What scientific method does Dr. Cam say she used to determine the age of the cuts in the tree? <laughs> Dendrochronology. Nope. It's how you age things. <clears throat> Carbon dating? <gasps> there we go. Sarah gets the point. Sarah gets the point. Sarah gets the point. Carbon hey, dating. Nice. I got one. Okay. Question number seven. How much cash is Jones, a.k.a. Jack Morris, Given up front as a bribe to participate in the match fixing. This is something we talk about on the show all the mm -hmm. time about money and how much things are worth and how. I'm going to say beep, 5,000 pounds. No. Eh, 10,000. More. 10. No? More no. than 10? You could just, we could just keep guessing 15. There we go. Say it gets the point. 15 grand. <laughs> Wait a minute. <laughs> Do I hear 15? Do I hear 20? 20? 25? Okay. I sense a theme here. <laughs> Question number eight. British actor and heartthrob Orlando Bloom played womanizer Peter Drinkwater in Judgment Day. Which single word did he utter right before his pitchfork murder? You. No. Come on, Mark. You can steal this back. Yep. What? Yes, Mark. Ah. It was what? <laughs> well done. Neither of which would be the words I would say if somebody was stabbing me with a pitchfork. If somebody came at me with a with that tool, I'd say, fork me. <laughs> don't fork um, me. <laughs> no, don't fork me. Question number nine. In Last Man Out, what did the murderer use to kill Fitz and fix him to the tree? Mm -hmm. Wickets? <laughs> Do you know what? I don't think unless you play cricket, you're going to know what this is. It's a cricket stump, which I think the wickets sit upon. I'm taking a wicket, Mark. You're close enough. I'm going to tell you, they make up the rules of it every time they explain it to you. There's a whole element of it that involves just balancing tiny things on sticks and then them wobbling. And, and then they drink and, tea. And tea breaks. Yeah. Okay, final question. Okay. How many runs does Jones score on the final ball to win the cricket tournament for the Panthers? <laughs> oh, who was first there? Sarah. He's giving it to me. Two? Incorrect, Sarah. Mark? Six? Yes, Mark! Oh. Yes! <laughs> it's some sort of magical number in cricket. <laughs> <laughs> well, that is the end. Mark has five points. Sarah has two points, which means Ashley has three points. Mark, Sarah, thank you so much for joining us. Mark, I feel like you pulled stuff just from the recesses, like little boxes in your brain that you I, didn't even I, know were there. I cannot believe I you remembered that. That. <laughs> that was fun. That's thank incredible. you so much. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you for joining us. That was so much fun. <laughs> Now at the end of each podcast, we do like to wrap it all up. If you haven't seen the end of the episode quite yet, then perhaps you may want to skip this part. 
Despite the dodgy match-fixing scheme, it turns out cricket had nothing to do with the murderer's motive at all. Instead, Jermaine Troughton confessed to killing Leo Henderson because he knowingly fathered a child during an affair with her daughter Scylla, who was hounded out of the town and went missing for 20 years, putting the baby up for adoption. Only when her grandchild contacted her did Jermaine realise Leo knew about his son and the reason her daughter ran away. In a rage, Jermaine turned the cricket bowling machine on, killing Leo. Fitzthera had been just outside the practice area and overheard the incident and proceeded to blackmail Jermaine for a lot of money, so she murdered him with one of her old cricket stumps. So, let's hear the moment where Jermaine confesses all to Barnaby. What did Leo do that upset you so much? I never had any time for him. This wasn't about C-10, was it? I don't know what you mean. We know about your grandson. Scylla's son. He contacted you, didn't he? He was looking for his mother. And you couldn't help him? Couldn't offer him a single thing? So I went to see Leo. Find out whatever he knew about his son. Turned out he'd known about him all along. All he was worried about was Melody finding out. (laughs) He threatened me. He said if she did find out, I would be very, very sorry. But after the quarter-final, you sought Leo out again. I was so angry. He was so uncaring about Scylla. So arrogant, boasting about his great innings. (laughs) I kept thinking about Scylla's life, my life. How they could have been so much better. I just wanted to shut him up. And the bowling machine was right there. Coming up in the next episode, Bill and I unpick a worm in the bud. In this episode, a woman is found dead in Setwell Woods, an apparent suicide, except that her suicide note is emailed after her body has been sighted. Chief Inspector Barnaby, right? You've got a bloody cheek. Well, don't think you're going to get away with it. My woods, my timber. That's what the judge said. Shall we start again, Mr Harrington? We don't seem to be on the same track. We'll hear from our first DCI Barnaby, John Nettles. What I like about Barnaby is that he's so ordinary. He's not far removed from the man in the street. He's a plod. As well as Dan Hamby, who's in charge of overseeing tours of the Midsummer Murders locations. We go to villages such as Dorchester and Thames and to Warborough. And these are locations where at least 10 to a dozen, maybe even more episodes of Midsummer have been shot. And of course, we'll round things off with Ashley Story's superfan face-off. Midsummer Murders Mayhem is presented by me, Nikki Chapman. A massive thank you to Ashley Story and to our guests, Carla Valentine and Manjin de Verk. This has been an All Three Media International production with special thanks to associate producers Rachel Blaster and Gary Wolf. This series was created by Story Hunter. The executive producer was Kirsty Hunter, produced by Shannon Delwish. The production team was Pam Muir, Ellie Abraham and Reham Musa.